Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio Detectives, where we bring to you tales from the greatest detective shows the golden age of radio had to offer. And now, with 926 episodes from 1934 to 1955, we bring to you Lux Radio Theater. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents William Powell and Kay Francis in One Way Passage with William Gargan and Marjorie Rambo. Lux presents Hollywood. This is a drama of two lives, of Joan Ames and Dan Hardesty, who meet when it is too late, but whose love is greater than destiny. On our stage are William Powell, Kay Francis, William Gargan, and Marjorie Rambo. Miss Norma Shearer, whom we had expected here tonight, is unable to appear due to illness. Between the acts, you'll hear Commander Carl A. Arlene of the steamship President Coolidge. Our music is under the direction of Louis Silvers. Nothing makes a woman happier than to know she is lovely and loved. That's why it's so important to a woman to keep her skin beautifully soft and attractive. Nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap because it has active lather that does a thorough job of removing dust, dirt, stale cosmetics. Women everywhere who prize the natural soft beauty of a lovely complexion use Lux Toilet Soap too. Before they renew makeup, always before they go to bed. Make the Hollywood star's beauty care your beauty care. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. William Powell broke into movies when a mutual friend introduced him to John Barrymore with the remark, I think Bill would be great for your picture. Mr. Barrymore answered, I wouldn't be at all surprised. So Bill got a job in Sherlock Holmes. And now, as the screen's most civilized detective, is about to do a new Thin Man story for Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. In his pre-picture days, Mr. Powell was an usher, a clerk in a telephone company, and advancing to the stage, once sang as well as acted. His singing career, however, lasted only one night. On the screen and off, Mr. Powell is a master of the soft answer, the well-turned phrase and is Hollywood's prime dispenser of unruffled calm and worldliness. Tonight he resumes one of his most popular screen roles, Dan Hardesty in One Way Passage. With Mr. Powell on the screen in One Way Passage was Kay Francis, who repeats for us tonight her characterization of Joan Ames. Circumstances have kept her from our microphone all too long. But tonight, for the first time, she's here in answer to your numerous requests. Born Catherine Gibbs in Oklahoma City on Friday the 13th, she acquired her inclination for the stage from her mother, a former actress. Miss Francis, an expert tennis player, has an enthusiasm for travel that has carried her across the Atlantic about 20 times. And we're especially fortunate to have that superb actress, Miss Marjorie Rambo, in the part of Betty, and William Gargan as Steve Burke. We raise the curtain now, and the Lux Radio Theater presents William Powell and Kay Francis in One Way Passage. Singapore, a gay and cosmopolitan city at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. In an expensive suite at the American Hotel, a young girl has just finished dressing for the evening. She stands a moment, looking at her reflection in the mirror. Then with a sudden movement, as though she just made up her mind about something, she flings a fur cape about her shoulders and turns quickly toward the door. As she reaches it, the door opens, and a man enters quietly. Oh, hello. Good evening, Joan. Going out? It looks as if I am. I hardly ever wear these clothes to bed, you know. Uh, sit down a moment, Joan. Now, Doctor, please don't lecture me. There's not a thing you can do about it, really. And I don't want to see that awful stethoscope again. I just want to take your pulse. Please. Oh, all right. You might have told me you were going out, and where? I don't know where. Just out. Will you be late? Perhaps. 
I've met a few people I used to know back in San Francisco. They want to show me the town. Our boat sails at midnight, so you can expect to see me about 11.30. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't do any good, I suppose, to ask you not to go. But I've told them that I would. Still, I must ask you, Joan. Oh, doctor, for heaven's sake, don't start again. I'm so sick of hearing about it all the time. My life is my own concern. And mine. I followed you halfway around the world to prove it. And you've been paid for it? Paid well? Yes. However, that's not the only reason I came. Oh, that was a nasty thing I said. Please forgive me. Of course. Joan, look at me. Your father asked me to come on this trip, hoping that I'd be able to do something for you. Well, I haven't. I've tried, but it's been no good. And it's time that you knew the truth. You're a very sick girl, Joan. Your heart's in very bad shape, even worse than when we left home. I'm sorry I have to tell you this, but it's best that you know. You think it's news to me, Dr. Bolton? What? I've known it for weeks. Perhaps even before you did. But, but you've done nothing to help yourself. I don't understand that. Well, what would you suggest, Doctor? The things I have suggested time and again. Rest. Complete and absolute rest. No more dancing, no more cigarettes, no more parties, no more cocktails. You mean I'm to be kept to my bed? Yes, Joan. Then what? There's a beautiful spot just outside of San Francisco. A sanitarium. I see. Oh, but not a depressing place. Oh, I know. I'm quite sure it's charming. And if I go on living as I have been... You're cutting your months to weeks and your weeks to days. And my days to hours. Is that it? It is. What you actually mean, and you're too kind to say, is this. If I do as you say, lie in bed, deny myself everything, even the mildest diversion, I may live to enjoy that charming institution. You state it very cruelly. <laughs> well, it isn't much compensation for such self-denial. You must decide that, my dear. I have decided. And that's why I'm going out tonight and tomorrow Joan! And... Oh, doctor, look at me. Not as one of your patients, but as a person, a woman. You know how old I am? I brought you into the world, my dear. I'm 24. 24, doctor. And I haven't even started to live. Now you offer me a few months more. A few months of living without knowing why. It's a ghastly thought, isn't it? Doctor, there must be something. Some plan. Some reason. Some scheme behind this life of ours. Well, I want to know what it is. Perhaps I never will. There's so little time left to me. But I'd rather die living than live dying, hanging on to an empty life on a hospital bed. You understand, don't you? <laughs> or am I being morbid? I think you're being very brave, Joe. Not really, but thank you. Good night, Doctor. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Joan. Hello, Mike. The usual, Miss Joan? The usual. Uh, paradise cocktails, already in wind. To lose your party, Miss Joan? Yes. They were making a bit too much noise. Well, you come to a good spot. I don't care how much racket they make in the main room, but the bar is sacred. <laughs> Here you are. Thanks. I'll have it at this table. I'll see you later, Joan. Look out, Miss. Oh! Say, why don't you look where you're... I'm so sorry. And I'm so glad. Oh. Well, I spilled your drink. Most of it. It was such a nice drink, too. What was it? A paradise cocktail. Paradise. I couldn't imagine a more appropriate moment to drink the last few drops. May I? It's all yours. Here's hoping you get everything you want. I've got it. Do you always break the glass after drinking? Only one words fail me. Mike? Yes, Mum. Uh, give me a glass. Right away. That makes us even. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Dan. Mine's Joan. Hello, Joan. Hello, Dan. How's your dress? Splendid. I always look well in what I drink. Well, what'll it be, Dan? Two of the same. Paradise cocktail. Right. What is that? Nectar? An ambrosia? Might be. You can't trust these foreign bars, you know. American girl? Hundred percent. If you're ever in San Francisco, make my home your home. Ames is the name. My mother warned me against well-dressed strangers. And my mother warned me against men who burst through swinging doors. You always burst in on people that way? No, but I think I'll make a habit of it. Hey, Joan, better get going. Your boat sails in half an hour. Right there. You mean that you're leaving Singapore? On the Maloa. And the Maloa's bound for... Well, of course, San Francisco. 
And that's where I cut my first tooth. Where I learned to parse Latin verbs. And where... That's where the fog wraps the hills in, warm and snug. Muffles the sound of the mission bells. It's where the gulls circle over the golden gate. It's home. For you too, isn't it? Ah, uh, not anymore. What do you say, Joan? You don't want to miss the boat, you know. You don't want to miss the boat, do you, Joan? I don't know. I've missed them before. Hurry up, will you? Paradise for two. Let's drink to that. Yes. Paradise for two. Bye, Dan. Goodbye, Joan. Another drink, Dan. All right, Hardesty, stay right where you are. Huh? Well. Hello, Steve. Keep your hands in the air, Dan. Hey, what's the matter here? It's all right, Mike. You can put the rod away, Steve. After I put you away. Hold out your hand. I've got a bracelet for it. Wait a second. I'll roll up my sleeve for you. It's been a long chase, Dan. But a guy can't do what you've done and get away with it. Yeah, so it seems. Come on. Slip him on, Dan. Sure. Why, you... Look out, Dan. He's got a rod and he'll use it. I hate to do this, Dan, but you asked for it. <laughs> now, Danny boy. They come along peaceful-like. Stephen, I guess you win. I always win. <clears throat> you should have known better than to try anything like that on me. Don't try another break, dude. I'll blow you in two. I'd just as leave deliver you in a basket. <clears throat> Not a chance. Just make one false move. Go on. Just one. I'm tame. Now what? The boat. And then San Quentin. Can I get my clothes? They're on the boat. I put them there just before I came to collect you. Consider it. Yeah. I don't think you'll find I've overlooked anything. Baby, you sure stuck to my tail. Sure. You never heard of Steve Burke dogging it, did you? You're a wonder. I thought I ditched you sure back in Paris. Oh, no. When I left Frisco, the chief says to me, Steve, don't come back alone. And he knew I would. Fine work, Sergeant. Mike, pick the man a drink. Never mind that. We're in a hurry. The boat sails in 20 minutes. 20? What boat are we going on? The Maloa. Ready? The Maloa? <laughs> Bye-bye, Mike. See you around. Hey, uh, how long do we stay chained together, Steve? Or are these cuffs permanent? You'll get used to them. I ain't taking any chances with you. They broke five of my pals when you escaped. Well, that wasn't right. They did all they could. They were shooting at me for three blocks. Unlucky, that's all. They missed me. Lucky for you I wasn't among them. Thanks. You know, the one thing I don't understand is how a nice guy like you can get yourself in such a jam. You ain't a mug. You're a right guy. And you could have hey, been one of the best... Don't near that rail, please. Huh? What's the matter, sailor? Oh, you haven't put the pins in yet, sir. You lean on that rail and you're liable to go clean over. Okay. What are you looking at, Dan? Huh? Oh, I was just looking down. Your long drop, wouldn't it? Yeah. Kind of gives you the shivers. Yeah. Get back a little. We're still chained together and I can't swim. You can't? Well... Look, look down, Steve. Hey, look out. Get away from that rail. Steve. Oh! Man overboard! Man overboard! Man overboard. Man overboard. There they are! They're Down there! Them. Get a life preserver! <laughs> Help! Help! Come back! I can't swim! Oh, well, you can't, can you? On the level! All right! Keep your chin up, Steve! Brett! I have not sir! Give me a hand here! You all right? Me? Sure. You all right, sir? <coughs> yeah. McDonald. Okay. Yes, sir. See that these two gentlemen get to their staterooms. Yes, sir. This way, sir. What number is that? You see how inconvenient those handcuffs were, Steve? You wouldn't have fallen in the water with me if we hadn't been hitched. How am I going to know you get dizzy spells? Hey! The handcuffs! Where are they? You know, if something happened to me, you'd be in for it, Steve. The handcuffs! Where are the handcuffs? I don't know. You don't know. My key, that's gone too. Listen, Steve. I couldn't let you drown, could I? I took the key out of your pocket while we were underwater so I could rescue you. You'd have drowned if I hadn't got my hands free. The bracelets. What did you do with them? I let them sink. Was them or you? Look, Dan. 
You didn't drag me off that deck on purpose, did you? Oh, see. Would I do a thing like that? I don't know. But I got another pair of cuffs in my bag, see? You're not sore at me, are you? Well, you could have let me sink after you got free. I guess maybe I owe you a little favor. It doesn't amount to a thing. Only your life. You can do me a little favor, if you like. If it's in reason. You know, Steve, uh, handcuffs don't look so good on a well-dressed man. But I hate for anybody on the ship to know. You understand? Besides, once this ship is at sea, there's not a chance in the world for me to get away. It's sort of tough on both of us to be ironed. What do you say? Well, all right, then. But if you make one false step, just one, I'll knock you off cold. And he's been asking for you, Miss Ames. He says you're on this boat and he wants to find you. Thank you, Steward. His name was Dan... Hardesty. Yes, miss. I didn't know, of course. The doctor said you weren't to be disturbed. And oh, I... but I am. Very much disturbed. What's that, miss? That'll be all, Steward. Yes. Well, who's that, John? The steward. A very bright and interesting steward. <laughs> well, you seem quite pleased about something. I am pleased. Pleased with myself and with life. Doctor, the picture you painted back in Singapore was drab and ugly. But I've just seen a picture of happiness. Glorious happiness. Even though it lasts for only a few days, the length of this voyage, it'll be worth it. Are you sure, Joan? So very, very sure. Come in. Oh, bonsoir, Jerry. Are you ready? In a moment. Oh, Countess Beryl House, uh, may I introduce Dr. Bolton? How do you do? Oh, come and tell me. Uh, the Countess is going to introduce me to some of the very gayest people. Good night, Doctor. Good night, my dear. Good night, Doctor. And it's called a paradise cocktail, bartender. Yes, miss. Make that two, please. Uh, yes, sir. Well, hello, Dan. Hello, Joan. I hear you've been looking for me. High and low. How's every little thing? Just fine. Your folks? Oh, great. That's good. You're looking well, Dan. Never felt better. Putting on weight? Oh, just a little, here and there. <laughs> so this is Dan Hardesty, an old friend of mine. I met him last night. Now, this is Joan Ames. I've known her all my life. Very nice cocktail. This doesn't happen, does it? It's never happened before. Never. It's all our own. An original creation by fate. Yesterday, I... I'd never even seen you. Before yesterday, I didn't exist. I didn't either. I feel as if I'd been away for years and years. And now I... I'm going home. Home? Like those gulls out there, flying free ahead of the ship. No, not like that. They've got the wrong idea, Joan. They're in too great a hurry to see what's behind the next cloud. That's not safe, flying into tomorrow. It's today that counts, Joan. Today and what we are now. I see. Then here's to us. From Singapore to Frisco. To the steamship Maloa. And our one-way passage. All right. Luck, Dan. Health, Joan. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, here you are, my sherry. Oh, Countess, may I present Mr. Dan Hardesty? Dan Hardesty? What? Hardesty. Uh, Dan, this is the Countess Beryl House. Delighted. Charm. Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, thank you, monsieur. Uh, thank you. Oh, monsieur Skipwa, come here, please. This is monsieur Mademoiselle Ames and monsieur Dan Ardest. Oh, how do you do? Would you care to dance, Miss Ames? Why, uh, why, of course. Excuse me, will you, Dan? Yeah. Take care of him, Countess. Oh, certainly, my dear. Take care of me, Countess. Countess Barrel House. Also known in some circles as Barrel House Betty. Dan! For Pete's sake, <laughs> shut up. I thought I'd recognize Mrs. Skipworth, too. Isn't that ace-high Skippy from Chicago? Well, what of it? How long have you been working this racket, Betty? Well, I've taken to bridge. They don't mind losing to a countess. Ah, you aren't thinking of taking Miss Ames, are you? Certainly not. She's much too charming, and besides, she doesn't play. See that you don't teach her. Dan, you're not going to give us away, are you? Don't worry, countess. Your honor is safe with me. Hiya, Dan. Oh, uh, uh countess? Uh, may I present Mr. Stephen Burke, my, uh... 
traveling companion. The Countess Bar- uh, Barrel House. Uh, Oh, a countess. Well, how do you do, your highness? Oh, no, no, no. Not highness to my friends, Monsieur Burr. Just countess. Well, that certainly is nice of you, countess. I don't suppose you'd like to dance. Ah, oui, oui, but of course. Oh, swell. Let's get away from here, Skippy. Did you see that mug I was dancing with? Sure. I know him. He's the toughest copper out of Frisco. Name's Bert. Do you think it's a pinch? Nothing else. They've been looking for Hardest Day for a long time. A tough rap? Yeah, the toughest. Murder. Murder? Yeah. If you call it that, for croaking the dirtiest squealing heel that ever lived, that guy had it coming. And he was out to get Dan. It was self-defense, too, but Dan couldn't prove it. Any chance of beating the rap? No, not one in a million. It's all over. He's already been sentenced. Well, then how? Yeah, he broke while they were taking him to San Quentin. Mm, so it's the rope, huh? Yeah, the rope. Great guy, too. He came to the front for me once in Chicago. I wish I could pay him off some way. Look, there he is, over by the rail, with her again. Look at him. He's got everything. Strength and courage, youth. Everything that makes life fit to live. And he's just... Aren't they gorgeous? Stars? Yeah. Funny I never saw them before. They seem bigger to me tonight, too. They seem so close and... and everything else so far away. All the little, petty, mean things of life. The struggle, the sordidness. That's gone tonight. And there are just the stars... and the sea. And us. Everything's so beautiful. There's no trouble in the whole world tonight, is there? No hopelessness. No tragedy. I'm happy, Dan. Really happy. Before our stars return in Act Two, I'd like you to listen in with me at the house of a charming young bride here in Hollywood. She's been giving her first party. Betty, dear, it, it was a lovely party, but it's good to be alone again. Oh, darling, it was fun, wasn't it? Oh, you poor kid, I bet you're tired. Why wouldn't you be? The boys danced you off your feet. And I know why, too. Because you're, you're so sweet. What a clever little woman Betty is. Of course, a man wants to dance with, wants to be near a woman who is dainty and sweet. It's so easy, too, to protect this most appealing of all charms the way lovely screen stars do. Such famous beauties as Joan Blondell, Loretta Young, and Dorothy L'Amour use Lux Toilet Soap, their complexion soap, as a bath soap, too. Its active lather carries away dust, dirt, and perspiration. Leaves skin fresh, smooth, really sweet. Try Lux Toilet Soap for your daily beauty bath. You'll love the delicate, clinging fragrance it leaves on the skin. Mr. DeMille. Act Two of One Way Passage, starring William Powell and Kay Francis, with William Gargan and Marjorie Rambo. Steamship Maloa proceeds slowly eastward. A one-way passage for Dan Hardesty, condemned to death at San Quentin. A one-way passage for Joan Ames, every beat of her heart bringing her closer to the end. Dan and Joan know nothing of each other's destiny, content with their stolen holiday on the brink of eternity. It's early evening. Storm clouds are gathering on the horizon as Steve Burke and Dan pace the deck slowly. I do 40 turns around the deck a day. Keeps in shape. (laughs) <laughs> What's the percentage of keeping me in shape? Well, exercise is better for you than staying up all night, mooning around on deck like last night. No, you're wrong, Steve. There's nothing better for me than last night. I don't know how to figure you out. You're making it a lot tougher for yourself. I suppose you know that. You know what's waiting for you in San Quentin, Dan? Sure. 
Oh, here you are. Hello, Joan. I was waiting over there. I never could get port and starboard right. Uh, this is Mr. Burke, Miss Joan Ames. How do you do? Glad to meet you, Miss Ames. Mr. Burke's an old friend of mine. We're uh, traveling together. How nice. Yeah, we're together all the time. Practically inseparable. Well, will you loan me Dan for the evening? I'll send him back to you in good condition. Oh, well, uh, I don't know, Miss Ames. You see, uh, Dan and I, uh, uh, I mean... Uh, uh, he means he gets very lonely. Uh, isn't that it, Steve? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Oh, monsieur, monsieur, oh, monsieur Burke. Oh, hello, Countess. Oh, I thought I would find you here. Didn't you promise to take me to dinner? Yeah, sure, but, uh... uh oh, well, monsieur Burke. Uh, well, uh, okay, uh, delighted. Uh, don't get lost, Dan. Don't worry. Come along, Monsieur Burke. Uh, goodbye, Jean. Uh, bonsoir, Monsieur Adesti. Uh, goodbye, Countess. <laughs> the Countess has taken quite a fancy to Mr. Burke. Ah. Uh, they make an interesting couple. I guess so. Well, shall we go on with the walk, or, or shall we stand and admire the coming storm? May not be so bad. Look, it's clear out that way. Just one little patch. There with the sun setting. Going down. Down. The day knows how to go out, doesn't it? In a blaze of glory. Mm. Stop me if I'm going poetic on you, but... But life is wonderful, Dan. And its best moment is when we find it out. Now the sun's gone. And there'll be no stars tonight. Does it matter? There were only stars. They're not real, like you. <laughs> Poor Dan. I wonder if I'm as real as you think I am. Tonight you are. Tomorrow you may be only a dream. But you'd make a lovely dream, Joan. Thank you. It's been fun, hasn't it, these last few days? Most I've ever had in my life. Mine too. And it'll be wonderful tomorrow in Honolulu. Yes. Yes, won't it? Well, you don't sound very enthusiastic. <laughs> well, I, uh... I just thought of something that might keep me on board. Oh, no. Oh, don't worry, I'll get out of it. Just think. A whole afternoon and evening together. That's the longest we've ever had, Dan. Sure, but... Well, we've got a couple of hours tonight. Why worry about tomorrow? Why bother about anything? Oh! Ooh! <laughs> that was close. <laughs> Want to go in? No. Let's stand here and watch it. It's magnificent, isn't it? Splendid and savage. Frightened? Why should I be? I don't know. Everybody has pet fears. <laughs> I got over mine. What was it? It might sound sort of silly. No, tell me. I used to be afraid of dying. What, you? So much of life ahead of you? Oh, but I'm not anymore. I found that it's nothing to be afraid of. You're pretty sure? When you get the courage to look death in the face, you see beyond the cold and the blackness. And it's beautiful. Something too shining to look at. A, a release and, and gentle. There's the rain. That's gentle too, isn't it? Maybe you're right about death being beautiful. I hope you are. I know I am. Book. Well, hello, Countess. All set to go ashore? If you can wait just a few minutes, please. I am looking for Dan Odyssey. Jean's waiting on the dock for him. Oh, yeah? Have you seen him? Yeah, I've seen him. Well, will you please to ask him to hurry, please? Jean's getting anxious. Countess, I wish there was something I could do. I wish for the first time in my life that I wasn't a cop. Oh, you? A policeman? Sergeant Burke. I'm dragging Dan Odyssey back to San Quentin. Hmm, but San Quentin... Isn't that a prison? Yeah, but Dan won't be in it long. He'll be swinging for murder. Murder? Monsieur Burke. Yeah, that's what makes it so tough. You never beat this rap, and your friends fell for him. Oh, Monsieur Burke, Steve. At least you let them have this one day to remember. You let them have to their show in Honolulu. 
Dan Hardesty ain't going ashore. Ah, but Steve. Oh, now, now, listen, baby. Uh, I mean, Connors, uh, Honolulu is the last stop before Frisco. If Dan broke, well, they'd, they'd kind of break me, you know. I can't take any chances. But how will you keep him aboard? I already got him locked up in the brig. Oh, the brig? Oh, yes. You mean the ship jail. Yeah. And the key to the brig is right here in my pocket. Oh, well, there's nothing to be done, is there? Nope. You ready, Carter's? Oh, certainly. Oh, oh, oh. Hey. My ankle. Hey, take it easy. What happened? Oh, I twisted my ankle. Oh, old Miss Steve. Oh, it's a pleasure, Countess. Oh, uh, Steve, you are very strong. Do you know that? Well, I, I ain't no, exactly no Apollo. Uh, how's the ankle, uh, honey? Oh, it will be all right. Just, just let me go back to my room for a moment. I will meet you on the dock. Okay. Come in, Mr. Burke. Well, what's the matter out there? You got the wrong key? Shut up. Who is it? It's me, the Countess. Ready? Shut up. I got the key in this sardine can if I can ever make it work. A key? Where'd you get it? Out of Burke's pocket. How'd you do it? Never mind now. Let me do the talking. I've got to get back to Steve and slip this key back in his pocket. What's the plan? Now, you lay low in here till the crowd goes ashore. Then beat it. I'll tell Joan to meet you at Dick's joint. Not that dive. Yeah, that dive. No one else from the ship will be there. Now, I've got it figured out how you can make a break for it. A break? How do you mean? Oh, Dick will play ball with you. He runs a tramp scheme, a steamer out of Honolulu to Mexico. Get him to uh, book your passage on it. Betty, you're a real pal. Ah, forget it, will you? Now I've got to get back to that flatfoot. <laughs> He's not such a bad guy when you get to know him. Well, so long, Dan. Lots of luck. Thanks, buddy. I'll need it. The tramp leaves a few minutes before the Maloa sails. Is that right, Dick? Yeah, that's right. The crew's aboard. They can be trusted? They're all my men. Good. Where's your money? I'll tell the captain. Hey, what's his name? Mallory. He'll be expecting you. I guess you know what this means to me, Dick. Ah, skip it. Any pal of Betty's a pal of mine. Oh, beg pardon. Missy Ames would like to see this gentleman. Oh, that must be the skirt you're expecting. Oh, Joan. Joan. Over here. Good luck, lad. Thanks. Hello, Dan. Betty told me to meet you here. Joan, I had no business asking you to come to this dive. <laughs> Am I forgiven? Of course. If you'll go with me to a certain cove I know, across the poly and down the hill, it's quiet there. The sand is whiter and the sea is bluer. I'd like to see it again with you. Any place you say. Here. See what I ordered for you. Paradise cocktail. <laughs> well, here's hoping you have everything you want, Dan. I've got it. I win. That one broke over the rocks. Hey, me. What did you say? Oh, I don't know. Oh, who cares? Oh, Dan. This is such a lovely place. I'd be content to stay here forever. Would you? I wonder. I know it. Joan... Would you be content to spend the rest of your life with me? In some far off, out of the way place? Of course, Dan. Anywhere. But you're so serious. I could send for you. Send for me? You see, dear, there are certain things that may take me halfway around the world. Mexico. Then don't send for me, Dan. I'll go with you there. Now. That's settled. Joan, darling, I, I've if got to If it's serious, tell you. I don't want to hear it. Not today. But, Joan, I've got so much to say to you. And so little time to say it in. We don't need words, do we? But there's something I want you to know about me. I know all there is to know about you. Well, you don't, Joan. 
I know how your eyes crinkle when you look down at me, like this, and how your hair waves off your forehead so that I want to touch it, and that your shoulders are broad enough to shut out the whole world. Well, that proves how little you know. I know I love you for as long as forever is. Joan. Well, I suppose we should be going back. I suppose so. Look, the sun is going down. Can't you stop it? <laughs> Great, I haven't much influence. Our day is ending. Well, what's this? Tears? I can't help being oh. a little sad. It's, it's been such a happy day. Doc, the Malo is down further. Aren't you lost? No. No, I'm not lost, Joan. You've got to go to the ship alone from here. But what about you? Joan, let me hold you close. I've been trying to tell you something all day. I'm not going back on the ship. Not going back? I can't. You mean... You mean you're leaving me? Now... For good? Oh, Joan, darling, please let me tell you. Oh, let me... Dad! D Joan. Joan. Joan, what's the matter? Joan. Dan Hollisley, I'm Captain Mallory. Captain, have you got a doctor on board? No, I haven't. What's the matter? Oh, girl fainted? Yes, I've got to get a doctor. Not around here, mister. Nearest one I know would be on the Maloa. Maloa? All right. Thanks. Hey, wait a minute. You can't go back there. It's suicide. Why, you'll get natural. Hey, wait. Come back. Hey. Let me get through here, will you? Let, Let me him through, through, please, will you? Fainted. Oh, dear. What's happened? <laughs> Let me through, will you, please? All right, please stand Dan. back. Back in the brig for you. Steve, listen. Tell Joan's doctor. How did you get out? Oh, never mind. Now get a doctor. She's sick, you hear? Help me to get her to her room. Dan. Come in, Steve. How is she? No word yet. Doctor's still with her. I'm sorry, Dan, and it's okay about, uh, I mean, uh, well, you can stay here as long as you want. Thanks. You've been swell, Steve. See you later. What, Doctor? Nothing's happened. I just wanted to have a little talk with you. Yes? I want you to help me, Mr. Hardesty. Anything. Joan's condition is desperate. You're the only one that can prescribe for her. Tell me what to do. She must have absolute rest and quiet if she's to reach the mainland alive. She survived this attack. But it isn't humanly possible that she could survive another. The slightest excitement might kill her. A shock surely would. May I depend on you? I... Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. But oh, wait. Doctor, I... I've got to tell you this. There is a shock coming. And through me. I'm under arrest, Doctor. When this ship pulls in, I'll be met by the police. Taken to San Quentin. What's that? Yes. I'm to be hanged. Murder. Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We've just
just concluded the second act of One Way Passage. Kay Francis and William Powell will be heard in Act Three very shortly. And now Mr. DeMille is getting ready to interview his special guest of the evening. But first, let me say just a word to every girl and woman listening in. Some time ago, someone asked several of the Hollywood screen stars this question. What do you think it is that a woman wants most out of life? What is most important to her? Maybe you think the answer was a successful career or fame or wealth. No. Claudette Colbert said, what does a woman want most? Love, of course. And Loretta Young said love. And Andrea Leeds said love. Then these famous beauties all agreed that soft, smooth skin is important in winning love and in holding it. They said this, all women want love, don't they? Then why do they risk spoiling romance? Cosmetic skin is so unattractive. Screen stars use cosmetics, of course, but they use Lux toilet soap because it has active lather that removes dust and dirt, stale cosmetics thoroughly, guards against the pore choking that causes cosmetic skin, dullness, little blemishes, and large pores. Are you giving your complexion the gentle, thorough care it needs? Are you using Lux toilet soap regularly? And now Mr. DeMille will interview our guest of the evening. We left the Joan and Dan of our play somewhere in the Pacific, on a luxurious liner bound for San Francisco. Tonight's guest in a few days will be retracing their identical course when he sails on a seven weeks cruise for Hawaii and the Orient. He is Carl A. Arlene, who during his 52 years at sea has risen from cabin boy on the sailing vessel to commander of the largest American ship on the, on the Pacific the steamship President Coolidge of the American President Line. Commander Arlene has covered millions of miles at sea and was captain of the first American relief ship to reach Belgium during the World War. As commander of the President Coolidge, he's responsible for the safety and comfort of 1,000 passengers, people of every type and every station. Yes, and of all the drama of life, can and does happen on shipboard, happiness, sorrow, adventure. And romance? Uh, it's coming to that. My happiest memories are those of hundreds of men and women who happened to meet each other aboard of my ships, who found the right person, the person they never seemed to be able to find on land. Mm -hmm. In partnership with Cupid, are you? I should say not. The captain has got too much to do without button into people's lives. It's the sea, water, sun, moon, stars, and that salt wind somehow... They, they get you, Mr. DeMille. Well, our shipboard romance is the real thing, Commander. Or just seagoing hallucinations. Boat. It's been my luck to meet any number of passengers the second time. People who met, married, and are coming back as husband and wife. Then there's another sort of romance. I remember a girl who met a young fellow aboard. The wrong kind. She thought she was in love with him and sent a wireless to her family. They were going to be married when the ship reached the man's destination, Singapore. The family sent several messages pleading with me to try and stop it. It's none of my business, but the captain has to be a lot of things besides the man who runs the ship. When the boat reached Singapore, the man went ashore and returned in a few hours to get the girl. But in the meantime, we had succeeded in exposing him and the girl. I'm happy to say, join us in really telling him off. Now, what's been your experience with criminals, men like Dan, who take your boat for any purpose but pleasure? At least they were all as well behaved as Dan. Just a couple of months ago, the Filipino turn the authorities turned over a criminal, turned a criminal over to me, who had broken parole and fled the country. Whenever it's necessary, the captain of a ship assumes the authority of a United States deputy marshal to complete charge of the prisoner. This fellow gave me a fit. He escaped when we tied up at Hong Kong. Tried it again in Japan, and he claimed he was an alien hoping to be deported. But at last he called it quits and is now doing time. Then, too, we have to keep our eyes open for narcotic smugglers. Mm, that must keep you pretty, pretty busy. And you have your, your crew to handle also. Yes, but fortunately, American sailors are men we can well be proud of. Their only bugaboo are the seagoing superstition the haunt, that haunt all sailors. They still hate like the Dickens to leave port on Friday. The black cat is poison. The one thing worse, the cross-eyed sailor. And, of course, they hate to find the old man on the wrong side of the deck. The old man is the captain on the wrong side of the deck is wherever he happens to be when he's not expected there. 
<laughs> well, Mr. DeMille, you've entertained many of my passengers and me on countless evenings at sea. We picked up this program as far away from home as Japan, so it's been a real pleasure to have actually taken part. Thank you. Thank you. Smooth sailing, Commander. Smooth sailing, sir. William Powell and Kay Francis in One Way Passage with William Gargan and Marjorie Rambo. A few days have passed. The steamship Maloa glides evenly through the blue Pacific. Only one day from San Francisco. On the upper deck, Dan and Joan are seated side by side. They aren't talking very much, but Joan is smiling. A calm, quiet smile, born of a deep understanding. Thinking about something? Thinking about you. How lovely you are. That's worth a penny. You know, I feel up to a game of shuffleboard, if you'd like it. What do you say we just sit and think, hmm? <laughs> Old Dr. Hardesty. You're getting more like Bolton every day. Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, Hey, giddy up. look out, son. Oh. Oh, 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 I could see that flop coming. Now, come on, up you go. Oh, you're not going to cry, are you? Of course you're not. Big man like you. <laughs> Give him to me, Dan. Let me hold him. Now, tell me all about it. I hurt my knee. Well, now, that's not too bad, is it? Let me see. Is that it? That black and blue spot? No, it's here. Oh. Well, what's this one? That's from yesterday. <laughs> I see. Well, now, what do you want to do? Shall we see the doctor and let him put a bandage on it, or, or do you just want to sit here with me until it gets better? Hmm? Sit here with you. <laughs> That's oh. a big boy. <laughs> well, you seem to have a way with kids. <laughs> it's just a matter of liking them, I guess. When I was eight, they used to call me Mother Joan. I had a doll hospital for all the kids in the neighborhood. And I'll never forget the time that I shocked the family at a Christmas dinner. I suddenly announced that I was going to have 17 children. <laughs> What's the matter, Dan? Hmm? Oh, nothing. I was just trying to picture you as a kid. Dan... I've been wanting to ask you, did, um, did Dr. Bolton say anything to you about me? What do you mean? About my fainting the other day. You see, he, um, well, he, he won't tell me anything, and I, I thought he might have mentioned something that, that I ought to know. Well, he didn't say anything to me. Oh, oh I am glad. <laughs> Please, customs inspection on the dock. Oh, Stuart, what time do we dock, please? About an hour, madam. Thank Have you. your handbag ready. One hour more. Yeah, I always kind of hate to see the end of a trip like this. Kind of sad, like lonesome. It will be more lonesome for Dan and June. That's what I was thinking. You know, I guess I'm all through being a copper countess. Through? Why, Steve? Oh, I don't know. But after what's happened, I... Well, I, I guess I wouldn't enjoy being the law anymore. I was kind of wondering if, uh... Well, uh... I was going to ask you, uh, uh... You see, uh... The ranch is more than half paid for, and... Uh, a ranch? Yeah, I got a chicken ranch in Petaluma. Ha! Huh. A chicken ranch. That sounds like fun. Well, it might be. Uh, if you had the right kind of company, uh, I was thinking of you. Me? Would it be fun for you, too? Oh, Steve, I would like it so much. But you know nothing of me. Perhaps someday I can tell you. Until then, thank you, Steve. Wait, wait. If you're going to tell me all about your past, well, mine ain't been no better violets either. What do you say we forget about it and start from scratch? What do you say, uh, Betty? Betty? You lug. You mean, you mean you're new? Sure. You don't think I'm falling for no royalty, do you? Oh, Steve. <laughs> Look, Dad. There it is. The golden gate. It really is golden, isn't it? It really is. 
I remember an old song. Keep those golden gates wide open. Keep, Keep those, those golden, golden gates, gates ajar. ajar. Yes, I remember that one too. I was born in San Francisco. You know, when I was a youngster, I always thought they were singing about this gate. I thought it was the only one. I hope you were wrong. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> well, we were going to have a last toast. Go on. You look sad, Dan. What is it? I was only thinking how grand this trip's been. Now it has to end. But we'll be together. I wish we could. But we've planned on it. Joan, I've got to go to Mexico. That business I should have attended to in Honolulu. You mean I... I won't see you in San Francisco at all? As soon as the boat docks, I've got to leave you. But you're... You're only going to Mexico. That's all. Uh, yes. Then we'll meet there. I'll meet you in, uh, in Agua Caliente. All right. Agua Caliente. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. All set, Dan? Yeah, I am if you are. Okay. We better slip these bracelets on. You have to do that, Steve? I got a delivery according to Hoyle. This ain't no petty loss in rap. All right. Uh, try to keep her from seeing it, will you? I'll do my best, Dan. Thanks, Steve. You're a swell guy. Dan? Uh, Dan, are you in there? Dan, may I see you for a moment? Oh, Dan. Excuse me, ma'am, but uh, are you looking for Mr. Ardesty? Yes. Do you know where he is? No, ma'am. But I know where he's going to be. Right up on deck in front of me very eyes, his friend, his pal, you might say, takes out a pair of handcuffs. Snap, snap, and he's a prisoner. What are you saying? Not Mr. Hardesty? The very same, ma'am. And a finer gentleman you wouldn't wish to see. A name a red-handed murderer. He's on his way now, ma'am. San Quentin, they say. And the hangman's noose. No! Oh, dear God, no. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, uh, can I get you something? No, no. Just tell me quickly. W which way did he go? Toward the gangplank, ma'am. But you'll never find him in that crowd. You'll never find him, ma'am. Oh, you're off the ground. Percy! Percy, have you seen Mr. Hardesty? I'm sorry, Miss Ames. I haven't seen him since this morning. But, Doctor. Dr. Bolton! Oh, June. June, what's happened? Dan, where is he? I've got to see him. June, you mustn't excite yourself. Oh, there he is. There he is down there. Dan! Dan, wait! Wait for me, Dan! Joan! Dan. Joan, darling. But I said you'd gone. Oh, Dan. Joan, dear. It's all right. I, I, I'm all right now. I just... I, I just wanted to, to see you once more. I love you, Dan. I love you, Joan. Goodbye, darling. No, not goodbye. I'll be the same. Until New Year's. Yes. Yes, that's right. Agua Caliente. New Year's. I'll be the same, Dan. I'll be there. I'll be waiting, Dan. I'll be the same. June, are you all right? I saw it. I said goodbye. Now he's gone. He's gone. Joan. Joan. Is there anything I can do, Doctor? No. It's too late. There's nothing anyone can do. Happy New Year, Betty. Money to be spending it down here in Agua Caliente. If things had been different, maybe Dan and Joan would have been here with us. They wanted to so much. Two cocktails. For the senorita, for the senor. Thanks. Here's to Dan. Here's to Joan. Senor, please, to watch the glasses. 
I didn't break any glasses. Why? Why, neither did I. Pardon, senorita. It was over here. You see, those two glasses, they were standing on the bar. Now they are broke. There they are. I cannot... Oh, Steve. Oh, I feel so strange. They always used to break their glasses like that. Joan and Dan. How much they loved each other. Yeah. They taught us what love means. They still love, Steve. I know it. Away off somewhere where people who love each other always meet again. Oh, Steve, they knew what love is. Those two. That ends our play. Making a postscript from Kay Francis and William Powell, both appropriate and welcome. Well, Mr. DeMille, while I'm a newcomer to the Lux Radio Theater, I've had a long and happy acquaintance with what it stands for. It means so much to a girl to have a fine, healthy complexion, whether her life is a public one or not. Lux soap is an excellent help to anyone who's particular about her skin. I'm only one of the many here in Hollywood who use it constantly. As for this theater, Mr. DeMille... I'm glad to find you featuring so many good love stories. I think that's the type of play people like most. I guess everyone has his troubles in actual life, so it's probably a great satisfaction to hear plays in which everything turns out all right. To me, Knight's play had a very happy ending. Death was not the end for them. It was just the beginning. What are your reflections on the subject, Bill, as our most consistent ghost? Did you say ghost, Cecil? <laughs> well... When you were here a couple of months ago and miling, you died and came back for a curtain call, and tonight you're doing the same thing. <laughs> well, Cecil, I'll always have a life to lay down for plays as stalwart as these. I agree with Kay that one-way passage is anything but a morbid story. You know, I was lucky enough to be fairly well acquainted with a man who helped write one-way passage for the screen, the late Wilson Meisner, great writer, with a mind sharp as his pencil. It was told that just before he passed on, a minister reached his bedside. Meisner was in a coma, but he regained consciousness long enough to look up at the minister, and he whispered, I just saw your boss. Meisner smiled at life, and he smiled at death, just as Joan and Dan do in our play. There's nothing sad about that. It's really quite a, quite a privilege to go out that way. Thank you very much, Cecil, for the chance of meeting your audience once again. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Mm. There'll always be a return package here for both of you. <laughs> Louis Silvers appeared to courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio, where he directed music for The Little Princess. Be sure to listen to the new Lux Daytime radio program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan, the story of a courageous woman in search of her destiny. You can hear it over most of these stations in the United States every afternoon, Monday through Friday, at 2.15 Eastern Time, 1.15 Central Time, 3.15 Mountain Time, and 2.15 Pacific Time. This new daytime program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan, comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Mr. DeMille. Edna Ferber's exalted position among contemporary writers is due largely to her amazing understanding of everyday people, especially women. Of her many novels, none rings truer, has greater charm, a more beautiful simplicity than So Big, a dramatic story of a woman and her son. Many of you recall it as one of Barbara Stanwyck's finest pictures, and I'm delighted to say that this great actress will again star in So Big a week from tonight for the Lux Radio Theater. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck in So Big with an all-star cast. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood.
Your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.